So I want to just introduce our keynote speaker for today, Karen Hankin. Uh, she is the founder of Hankin and Associates, and she is now also just a huge change maker, driving forward social impact here at USD. She's passionate about students. She's passionate about social impact. She teaches our business and social innovation class, and she is also just the master connector. So if there's something that you don't know how to access, talk to this woman. She knows somebody somewhere who is going to put you in touch with what you need. Um, she's the chairman of, chairwoman of our board of advisors here at the Croc School of Peace Studies, and we're really excited to have her today to share with us about the business model canvas. So welcome, Karen. I have a question. Do we have uh, a clicker? Uh, no, but I will get one, and we'll I'll start clicking. Okay. For you, so. All right. I'm I'm don't, I have I'm wired. I am I am apparently double wired because I'm being videoed here. Welcome everybody. I see lots of familiar faces. So um, first of all, th several students from my class are here. So thank you all, and former students, um, and lots of connections. Two of the speakers from my class, Kyle Moss, has spoken to several classes, and Mark Peters, and both have rocked the house. And uh, other connections, Aviva Paley is uh, one of the founders of Kitchens for Good, one of the coolest social enterprises in San Diego. And Marty Remmel and I are on the board together. And Darren Schwartz and I have worked together. And just lots of connection. And every coach in here is a rock star. So talk to them about their story and learn what they do, because we have just an amazing amount of talent here. Am I double, double miking somewhere? I feel like I'm echoing. No, I'm not echoing. Anyway, this is one of my favorite subjects to teach. And it's a tool that will carry you forward in any kind of work you do, whether you're going to be in nonprofit, in for profit, in government. These tools are so fundamental. I call the business model canvas a business plan on a page. It's very visual. Who's familiar with the business model canvas already? Who's done work on it? OK. Well, if you haven't, put it in your toolkit. And hopefully, you'll get some insights here. It's a very comprehensive model. So given the time we have today, we're only going to focus on a few pieces of it. And I'm actually going to pass the uh, mic over to Kyle in a little bit to talk about the partnership piece, because she represents that so well with her work with Qualcomm Wireless Reach. So first of all, because we have both, and again, who's with V2 here? Raise your hands. Doing V2, and who's doing the Social Innovation Challenge? And who's undecided? If you're undecided, you decide it by the end of this. <laughs> so the market welcomes innovation of all kinds. Who's a fan of stone beer? If you're not, you're crazy, right? <laughs> they started, when they started here in San Diego, nobody wanted to touch that beer. Their idea was it's Coors or Michelob, which are like water with a little coloring in it, right? I mean, they had to do amazing things to get their beer known, and they have become a leader now. In fact, Stone is doing so well, they're going into the motherland of beer into Germany and building a brewery and a distillery there. So they're trying to conquer that market. Suja, anybody familiar with Suja? That stuff flies off the shelf at about 8 to $10 a bottle. They've won uh, major awards all over the country. Um, Jeff Church, actually, who founded it, has been a great supporter of USD over the time, but incredible. Um, Tesla. You may not have one, but you might want one. right? Elon Musk, one of the most innovative people in the world, started with creating PayPal. Now he's trying to get people to the moon or in rockets. But Tesla is changing the world in terms of fuel consumption in many ways with their battery uh, technology. Instagram, who would have thought that they would be acquired for what they were by Facebook? Airbnb, anybody stay in Airbnb? It's incredible, right? They book more hotels than almost all the major hotel companies combined right now. When they started, nobody gave them any thought. They're like, whatever. Marriott, Hilton, all of them are pretty worried about them right now. Food trucks, another cool thing. And Uber, who uses Uber here? Again, changing the game. Taxi industry isn't too happy about them. But boy, have they changed the sharing economy, which Airbnb and Uber are part of, are changing the game. And that's part of what social innovation is about, right? It's looking at system level change. It's not just finding cool hotel rooms for less money, but also creating new economies for people who are getting rent that perhaps couldn't even afford to keep their homes in their renting out rooms. People getting experience around the world in local uh, homes, getting really true local flavor of uh, travel. And business 
has an opportunity to really be a force for good. So anybody not familiar with Tom's shoes here? The one for one model, right? Sometimes controversial. Some people think it does good things, some doesn't. The story was uh, Blake Mikowski went to, I think it was Argentina, saw kids who didn't have shoes, and if you don't have shoes, you can't go to school there. So he created this model of basing it on the local shoe style, creating every time you bought a shoe, a pair of shoes, he gave a pair of shoes to kids in need all over the world. Um, it has created a new style of giving, whether it's Warby Parker or many, many other companies that have this one-for-one -one model, truly creating a new way of thinking about how can you create a business that's for profit, but that has a deeply embedded uh, commitment to sustainability and social good. Um, the fair trade model. Nobody really heard of fair trade many years ago. Now it's everywhere. Starbucks had to adopt fair trade as part of their um, promotional aspect because if they didn't, they were missing out because fair trade's become really important, whether it's fair trade chocolate, fair trade coffee. But it's about recognizing people at the, at the lowest level of producers who never got fair wages and building that into the way that you price and promote your products. Etsy, anybody buy product from Etsy? Really amazing company, they went public. They've have had a little bit of trouble since their IPO, but they created a model for local artisans from all over the world to have a way to promote their product, right? Before, if you were a local weaver or you created some cool crafts, your ability to promote across the world or even in your own community was extremely limited. Etsy created a model for that that's actually been replicated by many. And Facebook, who doesn't use Facebook here? <laughs> Not many. Um, my kids tell me I'm a competitive Facebooker because I always want to see how many likes I get when I post. <laughs> um, and they also aren't on Facebook anymore, I've noticed. They, and my son won't let me get on Snapchat. Um, <laughs> So anyway, but Facebook with causes, I mean, if you look at what Facebook's done, certainly, you know, an amazing company, incredibly successful. Mark Zuckerberg just set the world on fire when he announced he's going to give away almost all of his um, assets over the lifetime after the birth of his child. So setting an example there. But also Facebook causes created a way for nonprofits or people who have a passion around something, not even a nonprofit, to raise money, raise awareness. So there's an amazing uh, research house called Cone Communications, and I talk about this in my class, that is one of the most respected companies in the world talking about corporate social responsibility and corporate good and how people are increasingly caring about that. And their studies show two years ago that 91% of consumers want to see more products, services, and retailers support worthy issues, and that consumers Choose product now based on do you have an aspect of social good? Are you sustainably sourcing? Are you thinking about your supply chain? Any business needs to think about that. Before, as we know, there were lots and lots of companies that didn't think anything about that, and they might have a checklist of, well, we give to charity. Now there's so much transparency and visibility about company practices that you need to think about that all the way through your company. So if you're building a for-profit company, Think about building in an aspect of social good. One of my good friends uh, created a company called Alpenrock. Has anybody heard of it? $200 fancy t-shirts. She started in 2008. Not exactly a good time to start a new business. Very high-end, sustainably sourced products. The reason she started it was she wanted to commit a large percentage of her profits to a nonprofit, an NGO called Room to Read. Anybody familiar with Room to Read? one of the top rated NGOs in the world. They fund girls' literacy and education. So she built her company around the model that she would give 10% of her top line to Room to Read, and that's on every tag, on every cloth, piece of clothing she sells, in every bit of her campaigns, and her products since she sold have flown off the shelf. She's been super successful. If you look at some of the top rated nonprofits in the world, there are organizations that run like businesses. And that's something to really think about. And uh, I know Marty would say that nonprofit is simply a tax status, right? You need to think about, Marty's run some very large uh, nonprofits here in San Diego. You need to think about as a nonprofit or a social venture to run like a business. And that's why the business model campus is so applicable. 
What are your opportunities for creating sustainable revenue sources? What are you, uh, your opportunities for creating measurement and impact of the good you create? So Susan G. Komen, Save the Children, Room to Read, they're all about accountability and transparency as far as measuring impact and demonstrating their impact. And therefore, they're some of the fastest growing organizations in the world. And they're worth looking at in terms of when we talk about value proposition today, go and see how they position themselves and, uh, and read up on them because they're very, very good models to know about. Thinking outside the box. I know I'll call on you. What is thinking outside the box? Uh, it's when you're trying to put yourself out of the situation and look at it in a, from a different angle. Right, looking at it from a different angle, trying to think of it in a different way. So as you start to develop your ideas, how do you think outside the box? How do you be a little different? How do you have a new approach, a new solution to how to do things? So much of the time, we box ourselves into the status quo. And the breakthroughs are not about the status quo. They're about how to do something differently. And there's so many opportunities for that. Our world really, really, really welcomes entrepreneur whoa, entrepreneurship and innovation today. So how can you think a little bit differently on how to solve a problem, on how to find funding, on how to position yourself, on how to build a product? The business model canvas, does everybody have, you guys have those in the center of the table, everybody have these. Sorry, it's in tiny print, and um, I think we can probably, can we send electronic versions to everybody as well? So these are the components of it. The important thing about the business model canvas is all these pieces tie together. You can't have one without the other. When I teach um, innovation entrepreneurship, I often use the example of the rainforest. So can somebody tell me what's really uh, important? Why does the rainforest work? Is it, is, is it Shin? I don't know how to pronounce your name, sorry. How does the rainforest work? What's important about the rainforest? Uh, I'll pass that one. OK. So who wants to answer? How does the rainforest work? Yes. <coughs> it's a natural ecosystem. Yes. If you took away the water, what happens to the rainforest? Take away the trees. So you're creating an ecosystem. When you create a venture of any kind, social or for profit, and maybe both, you need to think of it as an ecosystem. And this is why the business model canvas or social model canvas is so important. All these parts are very interdependent. If you don't think about who your customers are, and you have a really great value proposition or mission statement, it doesn't work. If you don't think about what your revenue sources are, if you don't think about how to best deliver your services or your products, all of these pieces need to be answered. And if any one of them is missing, you won't have success for the long term because each one of these props up the other. So the social model canvas, we're going to talk a little bit about the differences. There are only a few sections that are different. In social model canvas, there is a section called types of intervention. So it's what's the format of your intervention or how is your service delivered? So I'm going to call on Aviva, who is one of the founders of Kitchen for Good, Kitchens for Good. That's one of the really amazing social enterprises here. Aviva, can you tell me what is the intervention that Kitchens for Good does? Uh, what is the service or product you deliver? We offer culinary job training for mm -hmm. employed individuals. and take surplus food that might go to waste and turn it into healthy meals for the community. OK. So those are two interventions which actually work together. It's a very cool organization you guys should go visit. So segments, who are your customers? And in the case of the social model canvas, it, most people in a previous version of nonprofit world didn't think of customers in the way that perhaps they should have, which is a funder is a customer. If you're going after a grant from the World Bank or the Jewish Community Foundation or Leech Tag or California Endowment or anybody, they are your customer. You need to, is it, when you think about your customer, you need to think about why would my customer want to buy my product, right? So why would your customer want to find, fund you? Donors and grantors are all customers. And then the beneficiaries, the beneficiaries of a social model 
are recipients of the intervention that you offer. So if you're serving foster youth, what are you doing to help them? If you're serving the homeless, what are you doing to serve them? If you're working on clean air or clean water, who are the beneficiaries and how do we articulate what's important to them? So we're going to talk first of all about a value proposition. Who's familiar with value propositions? This is, this is one of the most fundamental pieces of anything you can do. If you put together a business plan, you need to be able to articulate your value proposition. The most important element of a value proposition is why. Why should a prospect buy from you? Because there is always a choice. The choice is they can buy from a competitor or they don't buy at all. And that's also a choice, right? So a value statement, a value proposition is a clear statement that explains how your products or services solve customer problems or improves their situation. It delivers specific benefits that are quantifiable. You need to be able to say more, well, it will make you feel good. How does it do that? What does it do? What does it change? And most importantly, perhaps, tells them why they should buy from you and not from your competitor. Because if you're going after grant money, there is always another nonprofit coming after that same money. If you're selling a new water filtration system, somebody else is going to offer that product. If you're selling catering services, as Kitchens for Good does, what's the difference of why you should buy their catering services or somebody else's? So there's always an option, and you need to articulate why your products are the one that a customer should choose. So this is one of my favorite videos here. Anybody familiar with, uh, who watches TED Talks, first of all? Anybody watch TED Talks? They're amazing. You learn so much from them. Anybody familiar with Simon Sinek? OK. I play this over and over and over again. And this is honestly one of the best tools. And if you've seen it once, there's always something new to learn from it. How do you explain when things don't go as we assume? Or better, how do you explain when others are able to achieve things that seem to defy all of the assumptions? For example, why is Apple so innovative? Year after year after year after year, they're more innovative than all their competition. And yet, they're just a computer company. They're just like everyone else. They have the same access to the same talent, the same agencies, the same consultants, the same media then why is it that they seem to have something different? Why is it that Martin Luther King led the civil rights movement? He wasn't the only man who suffered in a pre-civil rights America, and he certainly wasn't the only great orator of the day. Why him? And why is it that the Wright brothers were able to figure out controlled, powered man flight when there were certainly other teams who were better qualified, better funded, and they didn't achieve powered man flight, and the Wright brothers beat them to it. There's something else at play here. About three and a half years ago, I made a discovery. And this discovery profoundly changed my view on how I thought the world worked, and it even profoundly changed the way in which I operate in it. As it turns out, there's a pattern. As it turns out, all the great and inspiring leaders and organizations in the world, whether it's Apple or Martin Luther King or the Wright brothers, they all think, act, and communicate the exact same way. And it's the complete opposite to everyone else. All I did was codify it. And it's probably the world's simplest idea. I call it the golden circle. Why, how, what? This little idea explains why some organizations and some leaders are able to inspire where others aren't. Let me define the terms really quickly. Every single person, every single organization on the planet knows what they do 100%. Some know how they do it, whether you call it your differentiating value proposition or your proprietary process or your USP. But very, very few people or organizations know why they do what they do. And by why, I don't mean to make a profit. That's a result. It's always a result. By why, I mean what's your purpose? What's your cause? What's your belief? Why does your organization 
exist? Why do you get out of bed in the morning? And why should anyone care? Well, as a result, the way we think, the way we act, the way we communicate is from the outside in. It's obvious. We go from the clearest thing to the fuzziest thing. But the inspired leaders and the inspire or inspired organizations, regardless of their size, regardless of their industry, all think, act, and communicate from the inside out. Let me give you an example. I use Apple because they're easy to understand and everybody gets it. If Apple were like everyone else, a marketing message from them might sound like this. We make great computers. They're beautifully designed, simple to use, and user friendly. Want to buy one? Meh. And that's how most of us communicate. That's how most marketing is done. That's how most sales is done. And that's how most of us communicate interpersonally. We say what we do. We say how we're different or how we're better. And we expect some sort of behavior, a purchase, a vote, something like that. Here's our new law firm. Uh, we have the best lawyers with the biggest clients. We, have, you know, we always perform for our clients, do business with us. Here's our new car. It gets great gas mileage. It has you know, leather seats. Buy our car. But it's uninspiring. Here's how Apple actually communicates. Everything we do, we believe in challenging the status quo. We believe in thinking differently. The way we challenge the status quo is by making our products beautifully designed, simple to use, and user friendly. We just happen to make great computers. Want to buy one? Totally different, right? You're ready to buy a computer from me. All I did was reverse the order of the information. What it proves to us is that people don't buy what you do, people buy why you do it. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. This explains why every single person in this room is perfectly comfortable buying a computer from Apple. But we're also perfectly comfortable buying an MP3 player from Apple, or a phone from Apple, or a DVR from Apple. But as I said before, Apple's just a computer company. There's nothing that distinguishes them structurally from any of their competitors. Their competitors are all equally qualified to make all of these products. In fact, they tried. A few years ago, Gateway came out with flat screen TVs. They're eminently qualified to make flat screen TVs. They've been making flat screen monitors for years. Nobody bought one. At any rate. It's a, as you probably all know, the TED Talks are, actually, I'll let you get back to the screen. Thank you, Grace. Um, it goes on, as TED Talks are 18 minutes. But first of all, who in the room has some Apple product? Who has more than one Apple product? Do you even think twice about it? It's just they've appealed to all of us so innately about their design, their ease of use, that the why is is is. All of us get it. Why? Why would I buy an Apple product? In some ways, there's no other choice. So when you design your value proposition, you need to think of the same thing. Why should a customer choose you? Not because you have better features or not because you have a better story. It's, it needs to be something about how you appeal to the heart. And that's whether it's a product, a service, a nonprofit, or a for-profit company. So you need to start with what's your purpose, your cause, or belief. What makes you get up in the morning? And again, it doesn't matter if it's about social good or it's about creating the coolest technical product that ever was. You need to have a passion behind why you're creating this product, and that will convey to the people who will fund you, who will buy your products, and why you'll succeed in the market. So all successful organizations really need to think from the inside out. And I challenge you to go back and watch this TED Talk and think about how this can impact not only the venture that you're creating or the social innovation project, but even everything in your life. You know, whether you're choosing a career as students, whether you're deciding how you're going to design your life, this is a really important lesson to carry forward. So secondly, you've designed a great value proposition. Now you need to figure out who are you serving and why, and what's unique about your value proposition. One of the things is really and truly think about why your customer should choose you versus alternatives, because I mentioned there's always an alternative. And part of the alternative might be, I buy nothing, whether it's a product that they don't really need or it's a service they don't perceive as valuable. So focus on what is the real problem you want to solve. And in, in the class I teach, we talk about theory of change because there's levels of change here, but you need to get to the root cause of the problem. For example, whether you're solving problems of poverty, if people are continually on the food line getting food donated at food banks, the problem isn't that they're hungry. The 
problem is they don't have jobs. So another example, Kitchens for Good has created culinary job training for foster youth aging out of the, out of the system and for ex-felons. And one of our partner organizations, LA Kitchen up in LA, they, their entire culinary job training program is around ex-felons who are super hard to employ. That's why people go back to jail. So when you're thinking about the real problem you want to solve, you need to make sure you understand what your customer needs truly are. And uh, this is another one of my favorite stories. I really believe that people can tackle far more than they think they can. My name is Veronica Scott, I'm 24 years old, and I'm the CEO and founder of the Empowerment Plan here in Detroit. I think women have a really difficult time understanding how valuable they are. The idea of self-worth is very important to me because I grew up a kid of addicts, and we were kind of set up for failure. We were set up in a hole that we had to climb our way out of. I ended up getting a great scholarship to go to college, and a class ended up changing my entire life. The class assignment was designed something to fill actual needs. I did my research at homeless shelters, so the first product I created was the coat. The coat looks like a regular jacket during the day, but when you open it up, you can actually slide your feet in all the way up to your knees and Velcro it closed again to make a sleeping bag. I was talking to the homeless population in that area and getting feedback and making prototype after prototype. When I was on like prototype number seven, a woman came out of the shelter that I was in and she was yelling at me. She was full on screaming. And she said, we don't need coats. Coats are pointless, we need jobs. And really she was completely right because a coat is just a band-aid for a systemic issue. And what really would have the impact is hiring the population that would need them in the first place. We hire only individuals from homeless shelters, and then we train them in everything from sewing and manufacturing to employment, as well as tech, and whatever they need to become more independent and to be proud of their accomplishments and be proud of themselves. I'm happy to be working for a cause. This, to me, is one of the most poignant examples of understanding what need really is. Veronica, I actually talked to her last a few weeks ago, and we're hoping to get her to USD sometime next year. And she's extraordinary, and she's won awards all over the country for her work. And she came from, as you know, and sitting in hotels here, a really difficult background herself. But that's about getting out and talking to your customers, right? Not imagining what your customers want, but getting out there and having face-to-face -face conversations and understanding what the market wants. In her case, it's the beneficiaries, the homeless people that she was serving. In other cases, it could be you're creating a cool new product. What does the market want? But really tie your customer or your beneficiary to your value proposition and then challenge that. Go out and talk to dozens of people and get feedback because if you work in a vacuum, you'll never figure out what the market really wants. A mission statement is very different from a value proposition, by the way. A mission statement is more the what. Kiva, for example, we're a nonprofit organization with a mission to connect people through lending to alleviate poverty. Value proposition is about the why, and why a customer would buy your product or service in exchange for some cost or sacrifice. JetBlue is an example. They bring humanity back to air travel. For those who most of you are not old enough to remember, but when JetBlue came into place, the travel industry had gone just to nothing and nobody enjoyed air travel anymore. They had taken every comfort uh, service away and JetBlue reintroduced that and people really uh, enjoyed and started to buy their services and products. Patagonia, who's familiar with Patagonia? Anybody buy Patagonia products? I mean, they are a exemplar, they were a pioneer in sustainability, and everything they do in their value proposition ties to the way they market their products. They, it turns out that only 20% of the people that buy their product really care about the, uh, the environment, but in a competitive market, it serves as a huge differentiator. Kiva, why we do what we do. We envision a world where all people, even in the most remote areas of the globe, hold the power to create opportunities for themselves. They're very transparent about who they serve, how they serve, their repayment rates, and the impact that they make. Kind Snacks, who uses kind here? Anybody to eat kind? Crazy success. They have a really cool uh, cause campaign they do every month. In fact, this is another nonprofit that I've been involved with. 
where they have a Facebook campaign and you can win $10,000 as a nonprofit. Of course, it's good for kind, their word gets out there, but they also make significant contributions. And the founder, Daniel Lubetsky, wrote a book to walk the talk called Do the Right Thing. It's an awesome book, Do the Kind Thing. Patagonia ran this ad a few Christmases ago. They said that one of the problems is landfills are filled with clothes that never break down. So don't buy a new jacket was their campaign. It turns out they actually sold more jackets that way than they ever would have. But that was the campaign because they were aligning their value and values. So make sure you tie your value proposition and your customer segments together to know who you're serving and why. What are the characteristics of those segments? And most importantly, what will make them choose you versus alternatives? And we are actually, are we, we need to be done by 110. I'm going to breeze through a few of these. OK, competition. This is not on the social or business model canvas. I don't know why. I think it's a glaring omission. I ran a workshop a few years ago, and there were 35 small nonprofits in a room. And I asked them all, do you have competition in the market? Not one of them thought they did. If you asked Apple if they think they have competition, would they say yes? So that's interesting. A lot of the people in the nonprofit world don't understand or analyze competition. If you're in tech, which I was in Silicon Valley for 20 years, let me tell you, you're thinking about your competitors every single day. So never underestimate the importance of competition, whether it's direct, indirect, or replacement. An example, did anybody have a Sony Walkman in a previous life? You still use it? Sony owned the market at that time. They were pioneers in creating portable audio devices. They never saw, before Apple even was MP3 player, never saw it coming. And then the iPhone, nobody even has, anybody used to still use an iPod or an MP3 player? They never saw it coming. Sony, the Walkman, became non-existent. So differentiation is your competitive advantage. So think about how to differentiate yourself. What needs haven't been met? How can you create a more unique or better solution? And how can you stand out from the crowd? An example is Waze, which was a, a crowdsourcing app for traffic. Anybody use it? The reason that they were bought by uh, Google for a billion plus dollars, because they were a very unique solution in terms of crowdsourcing data. I'm now going to turn over to uh, Kyle, who's going to talk a little bit about partnerships and how Qualcomm really differentiates themselves using partnerships. We have a uh, oh. <laughs> Okay, can you guys know? There I am. Can you hear me okay? Um, so like Karen said, my name is Kyle Moss, and I work at Qualcomm. Has anybody ever heard of Qualcomm? Okay, all right. Does anybody, though, know what the word or the name Qualcomm actually stands for? Darren? You want me to share? Yeah. Quality communication. Exactly. So as I was listening to Karen, um, that's our why, right? We provide quality communications. And the way that we, or I get to do that, is within the government affairs group at Qualcomm in an initiative called Wireless Reach. I'm not sure this is going to work for me, which is fine. <clears throat> so before, I'm going to breeze through a lot, but I want you to take away a few things from what I'm about to present. And that is, what is Wireless Reach, and how do we implement these private public um, or public-private partnerships? Um, and how do we align our business objectives while also creating social impact? the importance of monitoring and evaluation, and then I'll breeze through a few of our program implementation um, examples so that you understand firsthand how we do this. So first up, we are a program that's about 10 years old now, and we were birthed out of the idea um, in our government affairs team that as they were having discussions around the world, and this is back again 10 years ago when 3G was still um, something that people had to, to grasp, right? So in, stop me, everyone understands 3G? Yeah, to some degree. Um, so essentially around the world, what our government affairs team was trying to do was influence governments to adopt this, right? So our team said, well, we're having trouble in certain areas. What if we gave them a tangible example of the benefits of our technology, and then they would better understand, like, here's what this can do, and here's the opportunities it can create in your own communities. 
So the idea of this social um, responsibility initiative was born. Um, and I say social responsibility, which is a super like hot topic right now, right? CSR, everyone's kind of heard of that. Um, but we call ourselves a strategic CSR program. So although it has kind of those roots of philanthropy, we're super strategic and we've got a ton of strings attached to all of the funding that we provide. Um, so we, in 10 years, have grown to over 100 programs around the world um, for which we are a main funder. So we provide grants to mostly nonprofits, but in the last few years, we've actually grown to support social enterprises and for-profit organizations as well. Um, and you can kind of see some of the numbers. Um, and one of the biggest points that Karen wanted me to point out is in these 100 plus programs, we have over 625 stakeholders. So that's on average six partners involved in each of these programs to make them successful. So this is a lot of words, um, but to, to better understand how we say that we are strategic and that we drive um, back to business goals while also doing good or creating a social impact, these are the few criteria that each of our programs has to consist of. And you'll see ingrained in each one of them um, how we are helping Qualcomm business while, again, at the same time, we're improving lives. So the first one says you obviously have to use our technology and prove how that can um, improve lives and create some sort of social change. The second is that the big point is you have to have stakeholders. Um, we can't go and provide funding to one organization and just say, go, good luck. Um, we know that it takes uh, it takes um, a village, essentially, to birth all of these programs. And the, the few suggestions that we give to these organizations is you need someone on the ground, you need to understand local contacts wherever you are working, um, whether that be here in San Diego where we have programs, or it's in a remote part of Indonesia where we have programs. You need people on the ground, your eyes and ears. Um, you need local government ministries, because I don't know if anyone's ever worked on um, public-private partnerships, but Without the government's involvement and support, it can be really difficult to make anything happen. Um, so those partners are a huge part of what we do. Once we grant that funding, we want to ensure that there is a set of people or a set of organizations ready to make all of this happen. We've got five areas where we implement these programs. So I always say the three E's, education, entrepreneurship, the environment, public safety, and healthcare. So all of the programs have to fall into one of those categories. And then um, meeting a community need that is aligned with the government's goals, which draws back to having that government partner um, and helps with that example again of what our technology can do for local communities. So saying if the Ministry of Health has a goal of decreasing the mortality rate um, of women in, in um, child, childbirth, you say, okay, let's show them, let's give them a tangible example of how to integrate tablets into the hands of community health workers that then helps increase efficiency and accuracy of the day-to-day -day routines that they have that then can lead back to re um, reduce mortality rates. So something along those lines. And one of the biggest pieces, again, are of our, our programs is also that from the get-go, and this is something if you've got an idea or if you've got an organization that you're looking to birth, please think about its sustainability right from the beginning. Those practices need to be woven into the fabric of whatever ideas you have. How does this exist beyond the CE funding? How does this exist? How does this continue on? And how does it create kind of legs of its own? So that's something that even before we grant funding to organizations, we ask them in the proposal process, what does this program look like after three to five years of our involvement? How do you, um, you know, generate revenue to continue this? Is it the adoption of the government? What is it that would make this program sustainable? So another really, really, really large piece of importance and a growing importance is monitoring and evaluation. So M&E, does that term kind of jive with everyone? Everyone's heard of M&E? Such a big deal. And I think a lot of people think, oh, you're a CSR program. You kind of just provide this grant funding and you hope it works and you hope that your reputation is built. All of those things are true. However, we know that the importance of our initiative, both internally and externally, can only be um, validated if we've got data to prove our impact. So what we do with every single program, and I hope that you'll consider some of these ideas um, as you're going about your, your um, creation of programs, is we start with a, 
again, like Karen said, uh, the why, right? What, what are you trying to prove? What is your hypothesis? And then what are you putting in? Who's going to be playing? You go through that logical framework, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, um, but you set that up right at the beginning. We then have all of our grantees report on a quarterly basis their outcomes and their indicators of success to say, you know, yes, we've granted this funding, you told us you'd get here, but every quarter, where are you? You know, what are those, those key performance indicators that you can report back that show and display, again, the success that you're having, the way that you're changing lives, and the display of our technology? And again, internally and externally, that can help us to prove the validity of our initiative. So if we're sitting with our executives, we have to say, we've invested this much money for every dollar we've invested. We can now tell you through pretty dashboards that we get $10 back or whatever it may be. So again, utilizing the CSR program to then drive back to business objectives. So I know we don't have a ton of time, so I'm gonna breeze through some of these program examples. Um, but if you don't understand anything, and I know I went really quickly, but um, please do come and talk to me, come and ask. Um, and as Grace said at the beginning, we are a sponsor, so we are looking for those ideas that utilize mobile, um, and we're hoping to see if there are those ideas that maybe you could come and you could actually apply for wireless reach funding. So if there are ideas that you're using a mobile device for, um, I'm really, really excited to hear about it, because um, I don't know, I mean, raise your hand in this room if you don't have a mobile device. Someone in this room that does not have a smartphone or a tablet or something. So I mean, Think about that, you guys. It is the largest platform we have available, and it can change lives. I'll breeze through really quickly some examples of how we do it, um, just to kind of plant some seeds on how you may approach this. So this is something in Indonesia that we started with the Grameen Foundation. And this is a lesson learned, because initially, we went in and we said, let's give everyone um, cell phones. Yay! We missed the boat. Like Everyone in Indonesia already had two cell phones at this point. So we were like, oh gosh, let's back it up a little bit, do a needs assessment, and figure out a better approach of how we can differentiate ourselves and create some kind of value. And what we did was we said, okay, you've all got smartphones available, or cell phones at that point. How can we create specific applications for the poorest of the poor that don't necessarily have access to maybe an app store that help them find a day job, or find a way to purchase a bus ticket, or find, so there's all of these applications that were specifically designed um, for the needs of these local community members. And as you can see, if you can read this, um, we now have over 15,000 women who have these applications on their phone and provide services to their community members through that, that connectivity. Um, and we have actually, so it says for at least four months, if they've remained in the program, they've actually lifted themselves above the poverty line because of the revenue that they've created um, at the use of their mobile device. So it's pretty incredible to see. And um, one thing on this one that's really, really neat too is not only did our funding start this and, and create such a great impact, it went on to birth a social enterprise in Indonesia called Ruma, who's continuing this work. And is that, I mean, that number was when we stopped in 2013, so that number is probably doubled by now because of the social enterprise that was a result of our initial funding. So I've got three more, but I'm going to just do one. <laughs> um, I think this one is just really timely. This is a healthcare example, and similar to what I said, um, we went into Nigeria and we realized that they have some of the world's most staggering um, mortality rates for mothers and infants. And we said, there's got to be an intervention using mobile to help and to affect these numbers. So we said, let's do an electronic medical record system specifically focused on maternal health clinics that helps these women that are, um, sometimes they don't have a doctor there, so it's just the nurses and the midwives themselves that are, that are giving all of the care. So we said, let's give them the tablet that walks them through every single step that they need to take so that they could increase the efficiency and accuracy of the work that they were doing and providing and they would just be more aware. They could send those reports over the 3G network to the decision makers to help better understand what's happening, why is it happening, are we tracking the right people. They could help adhere their patients to the, the um, appointments that they were supposed to make. So there's just a ton of implications for this. What happened though, and you guys are probably all familiar, back in 2013 is we had the Ebola outbreak. And our team took a step back and said, 
wait a minute. A lot of what's happening, and a lot of the reason of the spread of Ebola is because of myths, or is because of people, even in the healthcare industry, that don't know how to treat it, or don't know how, how to identify the Ebola virus, or don't know how to instruct their patients on what to do. So we said, we've got this, this network of tablets, right? We've got an infrastructure in place that we could utilize. So we were able to rapidly respond and change the, the emphasis of this program to help stop the spread of Ebola in Nigeria, which was a pretty incredible use case. And I could go on and on because I'm really excited about what I do. But I hope that kind of gives you some little bit of an idea how business can almost always carve out their expertise to then create a social impact. And I think it's of utmost importance that you understand and learn that now so that you can weave that into the fabric of all of your ideas. So I'd love to talk to anyone if you have questions afterwards, but I'll hand the mic back to Karen. Thanks, Kyle. Um, and Kyle has taught a few classes for me, and honestly, I could listen to her for hours and hours. And, and actually, Regina and I were just saying, we need to have you back and actually do a session, because the amazing alignment between the business and social impact side is something they think about every day. And uh, Kyle has endless passion about this and shares it beautifully. We're going to stop there, actually, because I think we've covered most of the topics. And I want to make sure we have time at the tables. We've run a bit over, I'm sorry. Our, my enthusiasm got carried away. And uh, anyway, so all of you have the workout, the breakout sheets uh, with the assignment. So we're going to start with the coaches are going to help you think about your value proposition. So if you have the sheet that um, we handed out earlier, it has, um, and these are exercises you can take back to your team because you probably won't get through all of them. But start with the top three questions. Why are we creating this value, this product or service? What value do you deliver the customer? And what is unique about our value proposition? Even if you only get through the value proposition part, that's the most important thing. Because if you haven't clearly defined that, and if somebody doesn't resonate with that as your why, you won't get to the next phase. So please spend some time now writing down your value proposition or writing the answers to these questions if you don't have a value proposition. And then regroup in a few minutes with your coaches and share with the group and maybe get some feedback from other members at the table as well. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're looking for a few uh, volunteers or victims, whichever you want to call yourself. Um, actually, I'm going to start with Rachel. Can I call on you? Is it OK? okay. Victim, my first victim. Um, Rachel just came back from an amazing trip with uh, USD in Sri Lanka, and which helped cement her vision for her a problem that she saw and a really cool solution, I think. So would you share that with us briefly? Sure. Um, Do you need a mic? Where is the portable mic? mic? Yes. yes. Yes, OK. Portable mic. Oh, this. Oh, I just need to stand there, too. OK, wonderful. Love being put on the spot. Can you hear me? Kind of? OK, there you go. Um, yeah, so I just got back from Sri Lanka. Um, something that has been near and dear to my heart and I've been looking for an opportunity to work with is aquaponics. And um, Does everybody know what that is? Aquaponics, OK. So think of uh, hydroponics, right? So a close system to be able to produce vegetables, things like that. But with aquaponics, what happens is the water um, system has fish in it. So the fish poop in the water, that's the fertilizer that feeds the plants. The plants filter out the water and provide fresh water back to the fish tank. So it's a really amazing system. I have no idea why people don't use it more often here, because you use 90% less water and 90% less land. Um, so I mean, everyone can have one in their backyard if you want to set one up. It's very, very simple to do. Um, so going in, uh, in Sri Lanka, I was on this global studies um, trip, and we did a homestay in some villages, and we were studying this model that is now um, grown to about 15,000 villages out there around Buddhist economics. So it's basically a way for them to all work together, share their resources, um, not necessarily have to you know, rely on having you know, enough jobs and things like that, but just utilize their own skills and their own crafts to be able to meet everyone in the village, to meet all of their basic needs, so then they can focus on their happiness and spirituality and all those things. But one of the biggest problems out there is renal failure. The groundwater is so toxic from all the fertilizers and um, people are, it's just, it's very bad. 
And in addition to that, it's really hard to get, you know, a lot of fresh vegetables. Most of the food is starches, you know, it's breadfruit, it's rice, it's potatoes, things like that. Um, so the organization that we were um, working with is called Sarbodia, and they are, um, you know, their main initiatives are nutrition, education, and um, entrepreneurship. So it was just kind of a beautiful marriage while I was out there, and um, so I made some partnerships with their development organization, their micro lending program, and really all we need is you know just some money to help them. And local and local and partnerships here in San Diego that you mentioned as well, right? Um, yeah, and so um, there's also a, a foundation here called Eco Life um, that that does a lot in aquaponics, and so I'm working with him, um, with Bill Toon, to help you put this together, and maybe even pilot it here um, in Linda Vista, because I'm a student here at USD, and I know there's a lot of initiatives around sustainability in the community, so. Great. We'll see where it goes. Yeah, thanks. Okay, who else would like to share? Oh, come on, guys. I will call on you if somebody doesn't raise their hand. Okay, your name is? Maylee. So hi, I'm Maylee. Um, I'm part of a team that's working on um, designing an assistive device for landmine survivors in Uganda. Uh, we recently just got back from a trip that we took this January um, where we were setting up some meetings with people there about the design and so there, um, ongoing war and conflict in Uganda has left a lot of people handicapped so we are working on a latrine aid to help those handicapped victims um, use the latrines there. So in Uganda, there's no such thing really as um, a handicap accessible toilet. They're all pit latrines. And so we're designing a low cost portable latrine aid uh, that can be manufactured by Ugandans in Uganda. Our contact is Margaret O'Rex. She's the founder of uh, Ugandan Landmine Survivors Association there, and um, she has spoken at USD, actually. I don't know if anybody has, anybody has gone to um, the Women's Peacemakers. Uh, she mm -hmm. was the Women's Peacemaker of 2014. Mm -hmm. And um, so we're working with her and her organization to provide livelihood support where landmine victims can produce the devices um, there and that'll create jobs for them wow. and um, and then they can sell them and also have this device for themselves. Wow. Yeah. Great. Do you have any prototypes done yet? Yeah. Um, so we took three with us on the trip and awesome. we met with uh, lots of different groups uh, to receive feedback. A lot of uh, vocational schools and um, groups of handicapped individuals to get feedback about um, what the best sorts of materials to use wow. and um, what what works for them and about the prototypes and what doesn't work for them. That is awesome. Perfect tie-in, a value proposition. I'll just point out, and their team, they've actually won the social innovation challenge seed funding last year and they're continuing on awesome. yeah. this. That wow. was super helpful to fund their trip and now we're looking to fund um, ten landmine victims to create 10 of the prototypes um, in the pilot area, which is Lira, Uganda. Um, so that's what we're hoping to fund. Thank you, wow. Yeah, thank you. Awesome, a perfect example of tying together many pieces. So, okay, anybody else? Can I call on somebody if anybody wants to talk? Okay, your name is? Uh, Karina. 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 Stand up, Karina, if you don't mind. Hi, I am uh, very grateful to have been able to be a part of the RISE San Diego Fellowship that is a partnership with USD here. And one of the things I realized is that there's a lot of um, need in urban communities for social innovation. So I think we have a lot of organizations that have good ideas that are going into communities and helping them with some of the issues that they're experiencing. But within those communities, there's also a lot of great people with a lot of great ideas for how they can help themselves. And so I want to create or partner with other accelerators and incubators that are already in San Diego, but bring them to urban communities so we can actually foster those ideas within the communities that are actually experiencing the problems. And my idea or my um, 
business is called Social Kitchen, and I want to use the kitchen component because everyone eats, and I want to use things like community dinners, um, cooking classes, all things food related to provide some revenue for the incubation part. So not just training and incubation, but also seed funding for these social entrepreneurs in urban communities. Awesome, wow. Well, I think there are two people in the room, Tyler with Startup Garage and Aviva with Kitchens for Good that can give you some ideas about both the startup side and, and food as a central theme. So phenomenal, thank you. Um, I think we are going to run out of time, and so where's Grace? Where we want to do? The, uh, I'll let you talk about the evaluations. And okay. so, a lot of ideas flowing around here. I'm sure. Uh, first of all, let's thank Karen for her presentation today. And Kyle. And Kyle. And our coaches. Um, you know, some of them might be able to stay around for a little bit and connect with you a little more if you wanted to meet another coach. So feel free to go and grab them. And uh, before you leave, we have an evaluation form on your table. Please fill that out um, so that we can improve these idea labs. We want them to meet your needs. Um, and if you want to keep working on filling out your business model canvas or um, want some guidance, remember that I'm going to be available for office hours for the Social Innovation Challenge in this coming week. Regina is always available as well to meet and talk about the V2 um, application. Uh, but we're gonna wrap up today and we just wanna thank you Are all. Are you gonna share the PowerPoint or? Uh, yeah, and I'm happy to share Karen's PowerPoint and uh, the videos and we'll give you copies of the Canvas as well so that you'll have those. Actually, the Canvas is on our website on the resources page, but we'll, we'll email out to you all as well and also the team matching information. So if you filled out the team matching form and are looking to join or recruit team members, um, we'll be sending that out tomorrow. So thank you all for being here today and uh, we look forward to seeing you in our future events. Thanks.